Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Excellent. Hello. So thank you all for being here. My name is uh, Claudio Marinangeli. I'll be moderating the business panel. Uh, first of all, before we begin, I'd like to invite Dr. Adriana Rossi-Hoffer uh, here to say a couple of words. Um, Dr. Rossi Hofer is Associate Professor and Director of the Global Engagement Office at University of Arkansas, um, Walton uh, College of Business. Thank you, thank you. Now it's on, right? Can you hear me? Okay. I just wanted to say a few words and first of all express how proud and we are at the Walton College to be able to be part of the Rome Center business program. The, the Rome Center business program comprises courses of financial management, uh, business law and operations management, which would be my favorite because I'm a supply chain professor, so I'm all operations. Actually, I enjoy the value chain slide. For me, it was supply chain, yeah. And we also offer courses here in the summer related to economics and marketing, the consumer in Rome, which is a very popular course as well. And for us, we are so happy to be part of the Rome Center because here the students not only get a very in-depth knowledge of these different courses, but deeply ingrained in the culture and history, the history of Rome and Italy. But this knowledge transcends the classroom because they are deeply connected to the Italian culture, living and experiencing business here in Rome. And this knowledge is very important for them as shaping, not only shaping their careers, but shaping successful careers because here they are able to acquire skills that are going to be instrumental in deciding their career paths and being successful in business. They're able to become more independent and flexible. And most importantly, I would say, two very important skills they learn here. Number one is the ability to deal with the ambiguity. You are able to see that business practices, they are conducted differently in different countries. So they're able not only learn about how business is conducted here, but understand why that is the case. How it's deeply rooted in the history and culture and how it contrasts with American practices. And because this understanding, they're able to build that connection and that bond to a different perspective that allows them to be successful while working their business, working in multicultural teams, working with international business partners, suppliers, customers, partners. And these are skills that they're going to transcend what they learn here in, the, in Rome and build and, uh, and uh, be able to be successful in their career. So, we, we believe that and we are very thankful for being able to offer our students the opportunity to, to study here with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diana. So our panel is titled, uh, Thang in Cheek, Business Wasn't Start in a Day. Uh, <laughs> the reason is that we wanted, this is a hint at our main topic which is the following, studying business in Rome is deeply beneficial and formative. We believe it is an experience that um, is deeply enriching from both the academic and the personal point of view. And this is true, we believe, for both um, business and non-business study abroad students. So to illustrate this, we have uh, three 15-minute uh, long, really, so quite uh, short speeches. Uh, I'm really concerned about this by, you know, since I'm a moderator. So we have... Uh, Three brief speeches um, that want really to illustrate this. And um, uh, I have uh, uh, three quite remarkable guests here that I would like, first of all, to introduce. Uh, first guest is uh, our first speaker, is Professor Federica Trovato. Um, Federica is Professor of Law at Lewis University uh, since 2006. She's a professor of business law at University of Arkansas Rome Center, so she's a colleague here. Uh, Federica is also a practicing lawyer and attorney of law, uh, and she's been working and she currently works with several large firms in Rome. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Vin Professor Vincenzo Mazzotta. Uh, Vincenzo is a professor of financial management and markets and business management at Lumza University, and he's also a colleague as well. He's a professor of financial management at University of Arkansas Rome Center as well. 
uh, Vincenzo is also a consultant. He's an expert in, uh, uh, as a consultant, he helps his clients to leverage the uh, remarkable uh, financial opportunities offered by the European Union uh, through the so-called European funds. So he's an expert in that. And he uh, serves as a project manager or other uh, organizational roles for his clients. And finally, unfortunately, our guest is not here yet, but she will be here uh, momentarily. We have Monica Archibugi, who, who is the founder and CEO of Le Cicogne, a young company that is currently operating throughout the country, offering babysitting and related services uh, quite successfully. So Le Cicogne is a quite peculiar case. It's a really uh, remarkable uh, success story in the, in the startup um, environment in Italy. As a matter of fact, technically, uh, Le Cicogne is not a startup anymore because uh, it operates across the country and it is planning to expand beyond the uh, Italian borders in 2020. So um, we'll hear a little bit about this company, the vision, the mission, the lessons learned. Okay. Uh, so really briefly, uh, before <laughs> I ask Federica to proceed, um, our first speech is titled Rome and the Law, How Lessons from the Past Are Still Alive. Okay, so in this first speech, Federica is going to lead us in a, a quick journey, um, exploring, uh, quick, quick, quick journey. journey, quick is the word, uh, quick journey, exploring Rome's um, magical mixture, as, as she called it, of heritage and modern uh, legal principles. And that is because, uh, Federica believes, you cannot fully understand modern business legal environment if you do not fully understand its history. And it so happens that business law was actually founded here in Rome. So um, I would say that I will introduce the other speeches later on so we can actually wait for Monica as well. And if you don't mind, Federica, you. stage is yours. Thanks. Thank you. Quickly. Quickly, please. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Claudio. <laughs> it's an honor to be here celebrating the 30th anniversary of the university. I'm delighted and humbled to see how much the center is trusted and held in the highest consideration by all of you. In my short speech, very short, <laughs> I, I will offer you some thoughts on the value of Rome as a place for developing and fostering the study of the law. But since we are now in a, we are in a heterogeneous context and not in a law convention, I will try to stick on the facts as much as I can. And I try to avoid the fascinating uh, tennis-oriented legal game of arguing and counter-arguments, so, <laughs> which is, by the way, typical of legal reasoning. Uh, moving from the title of the symposium, uh, it is undisputed that Rome was one of the most relevant destinations of the ground tour cultural journey. I leave and I will leave the arguments to my distinguished fellows since the complete answer, I think, is kind of nestled in an ideal place where human sciences uh, merge architecture, art, literature all together. And I mean, I'm marketing oriented, but I cannot say that throngs of intellectual writers, painters, in, artists, and aristocrats travel down to, to, from all over Europe to go down to Rome just because they were attracted by our magnificent law system. <laughs> and so the truth was that they would travel down here because they were looking for traces and evidence of a magnificent past of the ancient Rome. So despite the fact that we have substantial evidence that a visitor of the 1780s came to Rome fascinated by the glimpses and the traces of Rome, I still have to argue why ancient Rome still matters nowadays and why people, uh, ideally students of any kind, should, as in the past, cross the wall and come here. Uh, looking for sources, I think that we can find a good picture of how people alien to law schools debate generally still perceive most of the time, I think unconsciously, uh, ancient Rome today. And this was an influence that was registered in a recent article of a National Geographic. 
The article suggests that the idea that in many main areas of the life, the traces of ancient Rome can still be witnesses. And thus, then to a certain, certain extent, they are still operating. They are enumerated by the authors in this order. Art, architecture, literature, technology, and law, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> but uh, now comes the questions. Why ancient Rome, as confirmed also by modern professionals, is still teaching lessons to the world in the field of law today, in both common and civil law, and as unanimously still stated by all scholars. Well, in order to do so, in order to try to create some order, I try to draw up a list of what we learn and of what we could possibly still learn from them in the law area. And I think that the results are quite impressive. Uh, I will quickly read the list just to give you the sense of the matter. And then in order to comply with the busy schedule of the symposium and to pay respect to the promise I made to the chairman to be on time, I'll just briefly mention a couple of maybe three matters. The list is made of, uh, of four lessons that are maybe are really actual. Lesson number one, a fundamental concept of law. Justice as equal and fair. Lesson number two, female emancipation. Lesson number three, closer to business, do not ignore social and political settings in the field of the law. And lesson number four, that actually is a little bit provocative, uh, sometimes uh, Roman law can serve as common law precedents. I will start from the back because it's very quickly. Looking in the huge databases of common law cases, I found that there is a case in Wyoming dated back to 1943 when judges and lawyers used in practice Roman law in order to uh, determine the validity of a common law marriage. So there are sometimes cases in which it sounds strange, but they didn't find any other source applicable, and they need to go back, 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 and finally they went back to Roman cases. So if you look for, it's the RE Roman state back to 1943. But start from the top, the most important. Uh, they maybe sound quite peculiar because we are inclined to think that Romans were a place of injustice. But in the field of the law, they have special skills and ability. So let's back to lesson number one, justice as equal and fair. So the first idea of fair treatment of the parties as essential ingredient in the concept of justice was first created by Ulpian, there was one of the most preeminent ju jurists of the Roman area. He said that, that's from his word. The constant justice is defined as the constant and perpetual will to allot every man his due. And according to his colleague, Juris Consult Silsius, he defined the law as the art of goodness, boni, and fairness, equi. Thus, if law is a mixture of bonum, that's to say common good, and equum, that means fairness, in ancient Rome, the judicial equality was a duty to be pursued. Uh, of course, we know that Romans live in a world of injustice. We know there was inequalities, we know all that. But this was mainly referred to the economic and social environment. As far as the law was concerned, conversely, the rules were rather similarly to the guarantee set forth today in the fifth and 14 amendments, as my students knew today, and in Italian constitution, in most of the constitution that are today alive. Uh, just to make a couple of examples relating to that, 
we had a Praetorian edict at that time that promised an advocate to any party lacking one, exactly as is in the constitution of the US and Italy. So in case you need an advocate, the state will provide for one. We had, as is today, famous advocates. They were famous, they were rich, charming, and so on. And as it happens today, trials, in most of the case, was public. And the famous, the great advocates, those ability was primarily based on their rhetoric skills, could rise through those works. And as it happens today, in some case, there was famous advocacy turns into politician and vice versa. So it's actually what happens today in practice. Straight back to the second lesson, female emancipation. There is a famous article that's enumerated the evolution of women emancipation in time that say that, start like this, only twice in the history of mankind have women been considered legally equal to men. As far as we can see, affirm the authors, this is occurred but twice in Roman antiquity and now in North America and Europe. But how it is possible that you know that during their lifetime, they were under the legal jurisdiction of a tutor by law. And how it is possible that starting from such a sad condition, they reach emancipation. Uh, I will do that very briefly because there are so many laws that protected women, health and freedom that I need to really summarize. Uh, first of all, uh, they have a law that allows daughters to inherit equally like their brothers, something that for us is usual but stopped for years, ages. And although they need a tutor, what would happen in practice? If you are familiar with corporate law, you know you need to appoint a rector and you're able to remove them. Well, what happens in practice in Rome, that women had a tutor, but they were free to remove him, her, anytime they want. So if they didn't follow her instruction, they will be immediately removed, and so on, so on. So in practice, they can run their business, enter, entering their country just simply, having and using a tutor just to make life easier. Marriage was a private, a purely private affair, so both wife and husband can divorce at any time, just signing and writing down to the husband and wife. So they were free to remarry endless time to the divorce any many time as they want. And I close the chapter of women saying that we had the first um, female lawyers. Uh, the first female lawyer was called Hortensia. Uh, and she had the chance to be lawyers just for one day in life because after that they changed the law. <laughs> it started like this in 42. There was a internal war and the three triumvirs tri 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 at that time, there was uh, Octavianus, Lepidus and Marco Antonius, decided to a pass a law in order to collect money for founding the Angoni war against the assassin of Julius Caesar. Well, what was this law? To place a tax on the 1,400 most wealthy women of Rome. The women felt outraged by that, asked for a lawyer, for an advocate, but no man would help them. What, what they all did together, they chose Hortensia. She was the daughter of a very famous advocate. And they delivered to her um, they, um, the, the task to protecting them. What happens then? Women march to the forum, Roman forum, all together, where Hortensia articulated the famous speech. Please note that the speech of Hortensia is registered in many public sources at that time, so it was a very beautiful, beautiful speech. Uh, what happens next? Uh, at first, triumvirs waited, hoping the women will be back, and, but the day after, they were still marching and demonstrating, and they were forced to reduce the number of uh, taxed women to up to down to 400. And what happened in practice? 
But <laughs> the end of the story was that straight after, a law was enacted <laughs> that explicitly banned women's public speaking, but on behalf of third parties. What this means that a woman can be allowed to be a lawyer of herself, but cannot do that as a work, as a job. And we had many cases, in cases where women decided it was better to be protected by herself and in practice served as lawyers of herself. Straight back to business law, just a short highlights. Uh, because it's a, an area when, I mean, business law is actually more or less uh, uh, as it was at that time. Romans enacted the law just to deal with practical issues. They know that dealing practically with practical issues is the source for keeping empire up. So they established freedom of association at that time. They know how to combine capital and share risks. They allowed corporate personality. They created companies. They was called societas, societas publica noro, and peculum. There was a company, a corporate entity that was run by slaves. Then they had the first bankruptcy law, and in Rome we experienced the first financial scandal with the bankruptcy of the Callisto Bank. So I mean, we saw many things up to now. So. Now I think that we argue that about the modernity of Roman law and that it can serve as a mean of understanding both civil and common law. But I still have to give you the evidence that could be, the Rome could be a place for developing and fostering the study of law. And that, I mean, it was a visit, not just for the legal ruins, but for something more. <laughs> it's far better to visit monuments rather than legal ruins. And, well, and here is the proposal. If you look at the questions from a multicultural and cosmopolitan approach, keeping an eye to Rome as a continuum, or to put in other words, if you see Rome as a millenary living entity, studying here could be a cultural experience, a chance to enjoy education along with training, a chance to handle an additional meaning of understanding. And at the end of the day, as you used to say in the Middle Age, a thousand roads led men forever to Rome, or as it more commonly said, all streets lead to Rome. And that's the proposal, vice versa. Put it on the contrary, since in life, looking things from the right perspective could be an expected way of success, Rome could be, and I have an eye to my students now, a perfect starting point for reaching any professional and cultural desired destination. That's my proposal. So do not think of coming, must start in here and move forward. Thank you. I hope I'm not too late. We apologize. <laughs> and thank you. And welcome to all of you. So thank you, Federica. This was truly amazing. This is. Uh... Uh, fascinating topic and your timing was perfect <laughs> so um, I'll take uh, I'll take we can proceed with the next next speech right Vincenzo so our next speech by Vincenzo is a, an overview of the key factors influencing the launch and the success of a startup company and uh, Vincenzo will show us how there's basically two orders two type of factors micro factors that affect the, the individual the single entrepreneur and macro factors that instead pertain the economic and financial environment where uh, essentially startups end up operating which is really important that will lead us to our final speech by Monica Kibuji so uh, Vincenzo please Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, uh, Claudio. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I want to thank all the organizers and the participants at this uh, beautiful meeting which celebrates the presence of the University of Arkansas here in Rome. I'm very honored to be here today to be a faculty member of the Rome Center. 
you know, to teach in this marvelous uh, place. Uh, the key question of my speech is about uh, uh, what are the key factors influencing the launch and the success of a startup company. So I tried to provide an overview regarding this topic, uh, and as Claudio said, I have grouped those factors in two categories. On one side, we have micro, micro factors, that is uh, factors which influence the individual behavior, uh, the individual mindset, and uh, the second uh, category of variables are macro factors, that is, those variables which influence all the ventures which belong to a specific area, specific place. So, about the micro factors, one of the most important variables is the so-called entrepreneurial orientation. So, entrepreneurial orientation is the combination of personality and competence is useful to take good decisions and to implement ideas, so also the capability to execute. Um, entrepreneurial orientation, you know, uh, depends on a series of behavioral variables, such as flexibility and adaptability, decisiveness, leadership, uh, risk propensity, and all, you know, the point, the central point is that all those characteristics may depend on genetics, on nature of the, of the individual, but they may also be, you know, taken or enhanced thanks, uh, thanks to the experience that people make. In particular, if, for instance, uh, they make experience in an international context. In fact, there are many studies, you know, in, in academy, many studies have demonstrated that, for instance, studying abroad or working abroad for a, a time period improves your career and uh, gives you more chances to become an entrepreneur because an individual may develop the so-called entrepreneurial orientation. So for American students who are here in Rome, you know, the good news is that many studies have demonstrated that, you know, you made a good decision because your career, either in a company or as an entrepreneur, may be better. But why? Because, uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, this kind of experience may enlarge uh, the network, the individual network of people. You know, the, the alumni association is a very, very useful, you know, network, uh, also for getting a better career. You can get more information, you can learn different habits, different consumer behaviors, and you may become more flexible, more adaptable to, uh, to change, uh, uh, you know, experience and to change contextual frameworks. Um, so, this is the first point. So, the, uh, the experience you make may help you to become an entrepreneur and to get success. Uh, and also may help you to uh, move your entrepreneurial ante intention into entrepreneurial decision. So, because many people have good ideas, but, you know, they don't know how to, you know, execute them. You know, and they have, you know, they haven't the strength, you know, the motivation to uh, execute. But the central point of my speech is about, uh, you know, micro factors, that is, those contextual factors which may help ventures to arise and to get success. And in particular, you know, I deal with two key micro factors that are finance, so financial support and, uh, you know, ecosystem. So many studies have demonstrated that, you know, startup companies, you know, need in particular you know, a good financial support and a good ecosystem to live. But why? Because, you know, startup companies about the financial side should face the so-called death valley. At the beginning of their life, they should, you know, face, you know, a financial mismatching between cash inflows and cash outflows. They, they support huge cash outflows because they have to design business models. They have to make financial expenses or marketing. They have to make R&D investments, you know, and they have very few cash inflows. This is why many traditional banks, you know, have difficulties to support them. And this is why those startup companies need the presence and the support of specialized investors called venture capital funds. Because those investors are institutional investors which, you know, have a specific skill in financing new ventures because they have a long-term orientation and uh, so they, they, you know, are a patient, you know, they wait for time, you know, for the time for getting returns, to, uh, for getting profits. And because since they, 
invest huge amounts of money in many startup companies, they may diversify their investment. And in this way, they may reduce the specific risk of the uh, specific investment. So diversification is very, very important. And you know, about uh, you know, the numbers you know, of, the, of this market of venture capital funds in Italy, you know, I have made a little research on that, and uh, you know, those number, numbers demonstrate the strong interest that you know, venture capital funds have for Italy. In fact, you know, the, uh, the investments made in 2018 have been uh, more than 600 million euros. Uh, growing by more than 150 percent uh, uh, than the previous year, compared to the previous year. And the number of deals has been more, uh, more than 280 deals. Okay. But uh, the, the very significant information is that many international investors you know, have put attention on the Italian market. In fact, more than the, than the average uh, of the investments as made by international investments, investors. So the 53% of the investments has been made by international investors. So this is a very important information which demonstrates the strong interest that you know, international uh, you know, uh, investors have for Italy. The second point is ecosystem. So startup companies not only need money to get success, but they need to live in a virtuous ecosystem, you know, uh, made by, you know, uh, financial investors, political institu institutions, uh, consultants, um, other entrepreneurs, universities, research centers, and all those players are around a physical center called incubator. So uh, the presence of incubator, uh, incubators is fundamental for helping entrepreneurs you know, to leave the initial stage of their lives and to get a series of services which are important for their uh, you know, life. What are those services provided by incubators? Uh, networking, co-working, so information sharing, uh, managerial skills, uh, general expenses sharing, uh, support to search new finances, you know, because those incubators organize the so-called Investors Day, in which many investors, you know, are invited to uh, listen to the uh, startupers' presentations, the so-called elevator speeches, um, intellectual property assistance, uh, and so. So, since these entrepreneurs are young, they, they you know, have a lack of some skills. They need this kind of uh, uh, you know, training and services, which may help them to you know, uh, uh, overcome all the difficulties of the initial stages of their life. And also about the market of Italian incubators, we have very significant numbers, which demonstrate uh, the strength that, you know, uh, Italian operators are making on the market of uh, startup companies, in particular in the digital field. In fact, in Italy, there are more than 170 incubators uh, which employ more than 920 workers, 20 people, with a turnaround of more than 220 uh, euros, uh, million uh, euros. Okay. And the startup incubated in 2018 have been more than 2,400 companies with an annual growth rate of 26% from the previous year. And the total turnaround of those startup have been more than 550 million euros with more than 6,500 people employed. So, also this data demonstrate, you know, that in Italy there are many ecosystems and many incubators where startup companies may arise and may, you know, uh, become strong. And then, uh, you know, they, co they can go on uh, alone. But uh, what about Rome? So, the, the final slide. What about the Rome ecosystem? Okay. But also the, the data regarding the Rome ecosystem are very, very interesting. Because in Rome there are, you know, 24 startup incubators, eight venture capital funds operating here, and 40 co-working locations. There are around 1,000 innovative startup companies registered in the official national uh, register, 
And more than, about the research system, we, here we have more than 20 universities and 16 international schools. Where we have, uh, you know, um, uh, more than 150 uh, scientific centers, which employ more than 7,800 researchers. Okay. In Rome, they organize very important uh, exhibitions regarding innovation and startup companies. So, uh, the key ideas of my speech is that, you know, Rome may be important not only for its history, its past, and for the traditional industries in which Rome has been a leader worldwide. So, when we think about Rome, we think about, uh, you know, tourism, you know, architecture, historical sites, food and beverage industries. But, you know, in Italy and in Rome, there are huge investments on innovation and on new entrepreneurship, okay? In the fields of uh, Internet of Things, in the, in the fields of uh, gaming, social network, e-commerce. Uh, so, in the so-called uh, new markets and emerging markets, okay, where new technologies may enable traditional markets to move to more innovative ones. This is why, you know, coming to Rome and studying business may be a great chance, you know, to see the past and the future, to see a place where tradition matches with innovation. After me, uh, as Claudio will introduce, uh, we'll listen to the story of a young entrepreneur who has exploited the services of a startup incubator and of a venture capital fund. So, I give the floor to my colleague and I thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Vincenzo. So I would say this is the right time to actually hear from one of those startups in Rome. And I'd like to invite Monica Kibuji, our guest here on stage. Hello, Monica, welcome. This way, it's fine. Uh, that's okay. This way is fine. Easier. There's a chair. Let me introduce you. Okay, okay. Let me just introduce Monica for a moment. <laughs> So thank you for joining us, Monica. I know that Rome is famous for also one more thing, traffic. <laughs> so, so don't worry, we, we, we hear you, we feel your pain. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so as I was saying before, Monica was not here, so I will re repeat my brief presentation. Um, Monica is the CEO and founder of Lichikonye, this young startup, uh, quite an uh, exceptional case in, uh, and a remarkable case in Italian startup uh, panorama. Uh, Lichikonye, well, Monica will tell us much about that, uh, essentially offers babysitting and related services uh, in uh, most of the Italian, uh, I mean, most large Italian cities, so we could say reasonably throughout the entire country, and is looking to actually expand beyond Italian borders in, tw in 2020. So, first of all, congratulations. And uh, um, so, Monica will tell us, uh, her speech is titled Behind the Scenes of a Roman Startup Story in Lechikonia. So, we will see exactly, um, or in details, what it means to actually create a startup company, what the challenges are, what the vision and the mission of the company is, is, are, and definitely what the lessons learned are. So, Monica, thank you again, please. Hi everybody, thank you Claudio and Vincenzo for the invitation and I'm always happy to talk about my startup which didn't make me rich yet but I hope it will happen soon. Um, but anyway, uh, I don't repeat myself, well I, I think I do, I have to. I, I'm Monica Archibugi, CEO and founder of Le Cicogne. Le Cicogne in English means uh, the storks, uh, the bird that brings the babies. And so what we do is uh, we are a marketplace that helps uh, uh, matching parents who are looking for a babysitter and and babysitter who are looking for a job. Uh, so the, the problem, it's easy, and the solution, it seems easy too, but creating a company behind it, it's not easy at all. Um, so the idea came from my personal experience as a babysitter. So I was studying at university, I actually started babysitting even before. I always loved kids and playing with them. And um, what happened, What the strange thing was that I thought in the era of the internet where I had Facebook and email and every social networks and, and app to do anything, that I could find something online to find a job. And I actually looked for it when at that time, so more than 10 years ago, and I really 
really didn't find anything that did, did make me feel safe and uh, that made me easily find a job. So I did find a couple of websites at that time that would uh, help you finding a job as a babysitter, but they would look more like a meeting website. So I didn't feel safe about putting my picture on it, my cell phone and my personal information. So I, I tried with the, the old ways. I asked my mom and dad if they had friends with uh, young kids that I could babysit. And they said, of course, I'll, I'll have a talk around with my friends. And it, it worked, but it, take, it took time, like three, three weeks, I would say. I had the first job, I started one time per week, then I got another one after a couple of weeks, and I could say that in three months, I was fully booked. So it's good, it's obviously a good result, but still strange because in the era of internet where you can just click and find everything that you want, not the babysitting yet, not at that time. So I thought, I... What, what if it's not just me? What if there are other babysitters who are looking and have the same position as me? So what can I do? Well, first I started with a, a notebook. So I, I asked my friend if I received any more extra requests and I cannot obviously take because I was fully booked. Can I share it with you? Are you interested? And so I, I created a list of friends who were interested in working. I asked them their uh, timetable, uh, if they had a car, uh, where they lived, but most of the information actually I already knew it because they were my friends. But that, obviously that was not technology. So what happened is that after a while, I would just uh, go after those pages looking for the babysitter who was available, calling everybody. And one afternoon I remember that I spent, I think four hours on the phone to find one babysitter, one person to work for another parent. And I was like, am I stupid that I'm like calling for four hours people for free, for offering free jobs and everybody says no. So I think I have to stop this way because it's not working. So I have to change. I have to make people look for the job and I can be the meeting point, but I have to be smarter than this. So I thought, what is, Obviously a website would, would cost. I, I do not program yet, probably I'll start coding soon, I hope so. Uh, it's one of the things that I have to learn, I think in 2020. But um, I, so I, I asked around uh, how much would it cost to, to have a website as I thought of it. And it would cost between 10,000 euros and uh, 100,000 euros, depending on uh, the functionalities, who I wanted to work on it. And uh, I mean, a lot of obviously of different things, but not less than 10,000 euros. So obviously I could not invest those monies. I didn't have them. So I decided to, first of all, start uh, with something free that everybody had, that everybody could uh, receive notifications. And so I thought, what is it? It's Facebook. So I just created a secret group on Facebook and in that moment, in less than five minutes, I chose the name of my company. So all the studies that I did uh, in the university, like how to choose a brand, uh, uh, make research uh, before choosing it, no, I completely forgot everything. I just, how could I call it? Oh, well, Lechikonia sounds good. Yeah, because we bring babies around Rome and we have the car, so we just call it Lechikonia. So that, that was it. So the, that was super fast. And, um, and obviously this also created some problems, so what I'll tell you after that. Um, so uh, what happened is that thanks to Facebook, I passed from, I don't know, 10 friends, 20 friends, up to, I think, 20 babies, two, sorry, not 20, 200 babysitters before creating the first website. But again, I didn't start with the 10,000 euros website. I started with a basic website with just the information, with just a form that parents and babysitter could fill up. I would receive an email and I would just always do the manual work in the back. But the website that we have today with more than 90,000 users active in the whole country, with all these automation made so that users can do everything by themselves, it took six years or even more to arrive here. So and absolutely, it's nothing. What I always say to people around when they think about a startup, it's not like you wake up and you say, I wanna make a startup. It's, it's more like, I, I know how to solve a problem. And every day you solve a different problem. And the, a company just does that. Uh, the entrepreneur and the team 
it just does that. So do not think about the company like a place with tables and computers, but think about a company as someone who solves problem, a specific problem probably. And, um, and so it became a business exactly in the moment that I realized that I had 200 uh, babysitters and that I was not earning money for that and that I needed to create a website. And so I thought I could ask a subscription and with this money I could create the website. And in that time, that moment, I realized that could become a company. And, um, and so uh, the, after that, I realized also that also if you are a super smart person, you cannot do everything by yourself. You cannot do marketing, finance, uh, administration, coding, uh, and I mean, everything that comes in your mind. Also, if you are able to do every single part of that job, you do not have the time to do that at the same time. So um, I realized I needed a partner, a business partner. And uh, I tried to look around. And first of all, I thought, I don't want it to be one of my friends because I don't want to have a fight with a friend because of a job. So I don't want to mix friendship and work. So I, I tried in a different way. I met uh, a friend who obviously friends are super good for tips and uh, talking about something. And it came out uh, about a, a university that was uh, hosting a course that it was called Innovation Lab. Uh, that course was free, but it was just for 100 people and you had to apply and and get in, so be selected. And so I did apply, and uh, luckily I got in. And uh, in that course, I met a lot of people who wanted to transform an idea into a startup. I first of all found out what a startup was, and then I also so met a lot of interesting people, and one of them became a business partner. Um, for example, she uh, she's not working with me anymore uh, because we, she just changed uh, the her needs in time. So uh, she's been into the project for four years, and st I'm still here trying uh, to make it uh, to make it work. And so. Uh, yes, um, we, we learned in, during that course that the first important things are uh, people, so the teammates that you choose, and you have to choose them really well. And uh, obviously, we, we need money also to make a company. And um, you can find money in a lot of different ways. And they explained to me that there were four principal ways. First, family and friends. And I said, no, I don't want to have problems with family and friends. Uh, second, the bank. Well, but I thought at that time that the bank could take away my house, my car, and so I thought, no, no bank. And then I, I knew about public uh, investments, and they, they are super good because they actually give you money for free sometimes, uh, but they are super slow because you have to apply. It takes more than a year uh, to get approved and to win. Obviously, the competition is super high. There are other super good projects. And so the first way was private investment, uh, but I chose a specific part, the one that it was inside the incubator. Because I thought, I'm super young. At that time, I was 23. I have no idea how to build a company. And so I prefer to have somebody telling me with their experience how to actually spend this money, how to invest them, what to create, what to focus on, what not to focus on. And so I chose that path. We chose that path. And um, so we got the first 50,000 euros. And we thought it was we were rich, that we con could conquer the world with 50,000 euros. I mean, it was like. I didn't even know what to do with those money. Uh, and so, um, so we started, but um, so as you understand from, from, understood from my different jokes, uh, uh, we're not rich yet. It means that we, are, we do not have utilities yet, but that doesn't mean we didn't have results. We, we had a lot of results. We, uh, last year in 2018, we had uh, 140,000 euros in revenues, which is super good compared to the other years. We always had uh, some growth. We started the first year with 10,000, so we arrived at 140, is super good. But it's not enough because we spent 100. 90,000 euros. So obviously it, it has to be higher. But it, when you're a startup, and usually a startup should take three or five years to, to reach that point, but uh, the important thing is to see always growth and to have the growth, you have to spend more. You cannot wait to get the break-even point and then grow again. You have to go faster and faster. 
faster than reaching the break-even point. And so, uh, if somebody asks me what is the most important thing to start a company, I say, don't think about starting a company. Think about solving a problem. Think about what you're good at. What, why people should ask you to do something for their self. Why people should pay you to do that for them. So if you have a, an answer to this, then you probably have a company. Um, otherwise, just, just try to have experience in another company and then probably in time uh, you come out with an idea. There are a lot of us obstacles and those obstacles are obviously um, choosing the wrong teammates. And so when a person goes away, you have then to find another one and then training this person in what the company does. And then obviously that person doesn't have just to do things that you decide. That person has to bring his own part. And so his own part, it means that there is nobody knows exactly what to do. What is the daily routine? You create it. You have no idea. Do you want to do some Facebook ads today? Okay, you can do Facebook ads today. Do you want to do a flyer? You can do a flyer. Uh, do you want to uh, send an invoice to that? But well, first you have to sell something, then you can create an invoice. And so you choose what you want to do. So you have to choose teammates that have a goal in your specific company. So you share the main goal but then every single component, every single teammate has a, a different path that they choose by themselves to reach that final goal. And um, what, uh, one question Claudia asked me uh, to, to close the speech was, what would you do differently if you go, could go back in time? Well, my answer would be everything, because <laughs> uh, for what I know now, <laughs> for after that I saw everything after six, seven years now, and I know the result, I see what happens after, well, I, I would just go back and see, okay, then I do the opposite, so I know it will happen the other one. Uh, but, uh, but obviously I would not know where I will be now, because the results will be uh, some uh, of every single, single things that I've done differently. So uh, I don't even know if I actually choose the different path, but for sure I made a lot of mistakes uh, and if I could go back in time, I would try not to repeat them. And so um, please remember always that the most important thing are just people because uh, when you have uh, uh, difficult moments in the company and you will have them for sure if you'll start a company, please always remember that you have to count on somebody else and that somebody else uh, chose you and you chose him. And so it's, a, it's like a marriage. Uh, me and my business partner said that we had a, a divorce in some house because uh, she stopped working with me. Uh, but um, yeah, you share everything. You share time, you share money, you share contracts, you share uh, everything. So it's really important that you choose the right people. Um, so, good luck with all your try. Monica, thank you so much. This, this was absolutely precious. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it with us. Um, so, do you have any questions? Does anyone in the audience have any question for uh, uh, any one of the panelists? If not, I have a few. Please. Um, Uh, both, you know, there are many investments from uh, Europe and many investor investments from uh, the U.S. Uh, this depends on the importance that, uh, you know, the country gives to the market of startup companies. So we know that in the U.S. Uh, there is a, a huge attention on uh, startup companies and on venture capital funds. So there are important, you know, American um, venture capital funds which invest uh, in Italy. Generally speaking, the idea, you know, as I told you before, the idea behind is uh, diversification. So the reason why an American venture capital fund may invest in Italy is because probably in Italy there are, there are some startup companies which, you know, operate in a different, in some different context uh, sectors than in the U.S. This is why they may, they may be interesting and challenging for venture capital funds to uh, put money in Italy. 
Consider, you know, that uh, entrepreneurship, as Monica said, is a very fascinating activity, but it's also a very risky activity. Just to give you an example, for any uh, 10 investments made in uh, a company, only two, or ma maximum three on average, get success. All the others get to failure. But, you know, th those uh, successful investments may have a multiple of uh, sometimes uh, 30 times the, the investment made. And thanks to those few, you know, successful investments, the venture capital funds get reward for all the uh, investments made. This is the logic. Okay. Please, please, Francesca. I can try to answer also. also. For me, I think uh, f first answer is uh, different industries, where probably in Italy you can find uh, different industries in which you know, Italy is uh, successful. So for American students, they can uh, uh, study different uh, uh, topics. But I think you know that Italy, as uh, Italian uh, people, Italian entrepreneur has a strong creativity. You know, this, is, this kind of flexibility, this kind of mindset is you know, the value added of the Italian people. And I think that for American students it may be very, very interesting to study the problem solving approach of Italian people. Sometimes in our problem solving approach, uh, probably we don't make all the steps for getting a conclusion. <laughs> But in a quick time, uh, we immediately find a way to find conclusions to overcome problems, probably because we have to face many problems every day. <laughs> and this is why we are very, very good in uh, you know, finding a, a, quick, a quick but effective solution. So I think, uh, as far as I'm, as I'm concerned, this is a very important lesson to learn. I don't know what is your idea. I, I completely agree. I was just thinking of, of another point of view. I don't know if it's actually going to answer to what you were saying, but um, as Vincenzo said, we started, Italy was uh, the first Silicon Valley. I mean, I, now everything is based in Silicon Valley startups and stuff, but we, we had Olivetti. We had all the most important entrepreneurs uh, before Silicon Valley were in Italy. So actually, I, I would say that, I don't know, we became lazy uh, or Americans just had, are going to just leaving, they're leaving just their high points uh, because they understood a way because uh, everybody moved to America because uh, all the monies were there because uh, now people understood from the European experience that actually investing more gets more results. But now we're facing the fact that we, we, we actually 
had a bad experience with all the 2009 experience. And so now we're super scared about investing. Like if you say, oh yes, you can invest 100,000 euros, but you might lose them all because it's super risky business. People think, you know what, I prefer to invest in something else. But instead investing in super risky businesses is way more better because the percentage to get a bigger result is it's higher, obviously. I mean, you get a higher result, but it's super risky, so it's not super sure that you're going to get it. But in America, they're living a different point now. I mean, they're, they, they are in a different situation from Europe. And ju I just think that we are living a different period of history. And uh, in this moment of history, I, I actually think America is almost done because everything is moving to, in my idea, to Israel, Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv, it's really the, 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 the heart of innovation. Everything is happening there. Actually, America buys from Tel Aviv and the technology because they're way more further than us. And so I, I think it's a mindset. I think it's a mindset that will change soon because I see it in the, in, in the other start -uppers that I call. I mean, uh, I started seven years ago. I, I think it was me and other 10 people having a startup in Italy. And uh, now we have more, I don't know, I, I read an article, it, we're talking about thousands, thousands of startups now. So that's, that's good. But we just, we, we started later than America calling it startup, not companies. Companies we started maybe even way, boy, way before. So I, I just say that um, we, if we want to change this, it just depends on us. Obviously, Italy is a market, US is a market, we are all markets, so it doesn't change much. Probably in Italy, people should focus on uh, startups or about tourism or uh, food or uh, fashion. Uh, in, in America, they should focus on technology as they're doing now. Uh, I think we will, uh, we will see it soon, uh, but now we are in, in a change uh, situation and we're still understanding what's happening, but we will understand it just thanks to the people that are trying now. And the, the ones that will win will choose actually the direction of Italy. The one that will lose, will, anyway, they did a great job about pushing the people in going in a direction. Not their ones, the other ones, but at least they pushed everybody to, do, to take a choice. A, a choice. Thank you so much. Any more questions from the audience? Okay. So probably one thing I may add to this question is that uh, studying a challenging environment, business environment, is always very, very useful. Um, in particular, in management, we, we know that many of the uh, most relevant uh, theories today that we study in school that you know my students here have studied in, in, in my course and many other courses are actually the outcome of studying constraints and problems and difficult environments. Uh, Japan is a typical example. Classic theories like just-in-time, total quality management, they're all based on developing new techniques, new ways of doing things because of constraints. So this is also one more way to look at this. You know, it would be definitely interesting for uh, any business student, not only American, but any non-European business student to actually look at the European business environment, Italian in particular, because there are constraints that are peculiar, specific to Italy, and there are solutions that companies like, uh, like Le Chiconia have found, you know? And those are absolutely lessons to be learned. They're absolutely precious, okay? So, um, Thank you again. This was absolutely fascinating. Thank you for sharing it with us. So, yeah, please, absolutely. So we are a bit late. Yeah. <laughs> so if there's another question, uh, uh, I think the panel is over. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. That was just beautiful. Thank you so much.